Like, I have a lot to talk about, I have a lot of notes. And he knows exactly what's going on between all the members of his family. It was a bit cartoonish. Eamon, the anagram. And I love Phantom of the Opera. House of the Dragon, episode eight, was a pretty emotional episode in my opinion. It was not perfect. There was a couple things that I, I did not like, but overall, this was one of my absolute favorite episodes um, of the series so far. There's so many things that it did well, so many things that it paid off, so many things that it had been building towards that we kind of saw, not necessarily resolved, but as I say, pay off or, or you see a, uh, you begin to see a reason for why they did certain things in the show. So I, I have a lot to talk about, I have a lot of notes. <laughs> I have, oh geez, I have like three and a half pages of notes, a little more than usual. So let's get right into it. As usual, I've split my notes into sections as best I can. So let's start with the kind of star of this episode, Viserys. First and foremost, I just want to say the actor, Patty, who played him, is a fantastic actor. He deserves all the accolades. He deserves an Emmy. He deserves everything. He was an amazing Viserys, and in particular in this episode, you just really got to see uh, from from a craft standpoint, not as you know, the story is. We'll talk about the story in a second. But just from a like acting craft standpoint, it was amazing to watch him perform the role of Viserys. So well done, well done, so good. So in this episode, we got to see pretty much the worst form of Viserys, uh, which which of course I do not mean uh, morally speaking, or at least not necessarily. But he's he's fully decayed. He looks like a White Walker basically at this point. Uh, one of my all-time favorite movies is Kingdom of Heaven. And Viserys in this episode kind of reminded me of the Leper King of Jerusalem. In the film Kingdom of Heaven, um, the way they have a gold mask to hide his leprosy, it, it that's immediately what Viserys' mask made me think of. And I do wonder if they took inspiration from that. It looked like halfway between Phantom of the Opera and the Leper King of Jerusalem. And I love Phantom of the Opera and I love Kingdom of Heaven in particular. My favorite character in Kingdom of Heaven is the Leper King. So yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm just a big fan. <laughs> Maybe that's why uh, I like this episode so much. But it's just so much to unpack with this character in this episode. Some of it fits better in some of my sections to do with the individual scenes and other moments. Um, but I do have a substantial Viserys section here. So we saw throughout the show, and I mentioned it several times in my episode reviews as we went, all of the times that we saw what Viserys tells Alicent being different from what he tells Rhaenyra. So each of these young women sees a very different side of Viserys, sees a very different side of where Viserys' thoughts and mind are, what his, what his desires and opinions are. Neither of them sees a complete picture of, of his mental state or his, his thoughts on matters. That neither of them gets a complete picture, basically, of Viserys. And in this episode, not only do we see a continuation of that, we saw almost a sort of planting and payoff of this recurring trend. So this happened over and over again in the series, and we saw that begin to cause problems, of course, but not like really truly fully. And here we saw the ultimate way in which this is the thing that in this version of events, which is, it is different from the book, in this version of events, it is kind of the, the crux of the issue. What I refer to, of course, is the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy. And I also have in my notes, just uh, on a slightly separate note, um, the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy is also planted and paid off here. So both things come together in a way that feels so powerful for that reason, because we planted this prophecy, which to be completely honest, when they first introduced the prophecy of the Song of Ice and Fire in the first episode, I did roll my eyes at that a little bit because it, it seemed a bit to me, while fairly classily done, as just a way to kind of nod at and tie into Game of Thrones, which is like, hey, Hey, Game of Thrones, guys, you know, Game of Thrones. Like, it was it was handled decently well for it being something like that, but that's what it felt to me like. And I was like, okay, okay, whatever. Yeah, we know this is connected to Game of Thrones. Like, you don't need to do that. But so planting that prophecy, and we do hear him mention it again, uh, or it comes up again in, in between also, and that was not the only time they mentioned it in the show. And so here, again, this recurring trend of the series telling Alicent one thing and Rhaenyra another, and him bringing up the prophecy to Rhaenyra early on in the show. And here, in this episode we see the prophecy come back in a very real way that affects the present day plot. is isn't just a tie into Game of Thrones and is also paying off that what I tell Rhaenyra is not what I tell Alicent and what I tell Alicent is not what I tell Rhaenyra. And the way that he discusses the prophecy with Rhaenyra, which she was fully aware of because of him telling it to her early on when he named her his heir and now sharing pieces of it with Alicent and not ever having actually shared enough of it with her where she would actually know what he's talking about. Because if she knew about this prophecy, um, and she knew how he felt about things and why he was worried about his heir, etc., etc. 
then when he was rambling, she would have recognized what he was talking about, possibly. Um, but because she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't know what he's talking about, but she does hear him say Aegon and the prince that was promised. And this gives plausible, not deniability, but it is plausible reasoning for Alicent to take certain actions which she will imminently take. I don't want to say, even though I think it's pretty clear what, she, what, what will happen next. That being said, the fact that Rhaenyra's son is also named Aegon, it does make Alicent's reasoning based on what she's just heard from Viserys um, a little bit thin, but it still gives her more, more of a plausible reason to believe that her next actions are justified and not purely motivated by ambition. In general, the show has tried to give Allison's character and the behaviors and motivations of that character more nuance, and I have enjoyed that, which is why I was quite disappointed with how almost caricaturish Allison seemed after the time skip, because I was enjoying the nuance they seemed to be adding to this character. And they did step it back a bit and and kind of bring nuance back into Allison's character in this episode, which is again why I was so very, very impressed with and pleased with this episode. Uh, this is the series section, so back to the series. <laughs> the series in this episode um, is just such a tragic figure, and not just because he's literally falling apart like before your eyes. I mean, obviously that's tragic, but we see sort of at the 11th hour that he's kind of found the courage and the the willingness to actually speak his mind and to make more concrete statements to stand his ground on things to make his wishes clear but unfortunately it is too little too late and he is also personally just too ill to truly actually make clear what he's saying and what he wants especially in that final scene where he's sharing with Allison the song of ice and fire or well he's sharing he thinks he's sharing it with rain Europe when he's giving his last gasp about the song of ice and fire so he sort of like finally finds it in himself to take charge here and he sort of stumbles at the last hurdle because while he's trying to put his, his affairs in order, so to speak, he's actually, he ends up creating a new problem with this, again, when he's accidentally sharing with Allison, who he thinks is Rhaenyra in his delirium, when he's telling her about the Song of Ice and Fire. He thinks he's finally, you know, said his piece, said what he wants, told people how it is, and put matters to rest and put a lid on the Song of Ice and Fire. And by doing this, he should have been doing this all along. He should have been doing this much sooner. And if he had, he we wouldn't be in this situation and we wouldn't be in the situation we're about to be in. Um, so he's finally doing it. But by finally doing it, he's actually creating a new problem. <laughs> so it's very tragic to see because he's finally doing the thing that you have been wanting him to do this whole time. Um, and like I said, it is too late. And also because it's so last minute and so incomplete, it's... It doesn't. It, it creates more problems than it solves. And I will unpack the this the dinner scene by itself um, in a bit. But I wanted to talk about how the dinner scene, in particular, as concerns Viserys himself, mirrors and contrasts with the depictions of Viserys in the wedding scene and in the funeral scene. So I talk about how those two scenes kind of paralleled each other in the having of everybody around Viserys politicking and having all the machinations and all of the, the glances and all of the stuff that's going on with everybody around Viserys and Viserys himself. Kind of being this island of uh, obliviousness. When at the wedding he's kind of sitting at the table just eating his dinner and is kind of oblivious to the turmoil around him. Similarly at the wedding he's kind of losing it and isn't really aware of all the politics. doesn't seem anyway to be aware of all the politicking going on around him. So we've reunited the players from those previous occasions, uh, or at least the most important, the key players from those, from the wedding and the funeral, and now we've gathered them all for a family reunion, a sit-down dinner, and the parties who were present at those previous occasions who were doing their thing around Viserys, they're all there. Um, and here Viserys is at his his weakest, he's at his illest, he's, he should be the least aware and the least lucid. But it is at this point that he shows that he is not as oblivious and unaware as he seemed or as we would think he is. That it is not that he doesn't know, it's that he hoped for better. That he knows exactly what's going on between all the members of his family. He's he's not ignorant of it. He's not like, in la-la land, so to speak. It's more of a, no, I know what you're all up to and have been up to and I'm really disappointed in you. I hoped that you could do better. And it is his fault. Uh, I'm not saying that that means that uh, he was right to behave the way he did. He's the king and he shouldn't have let things get to this point. But it shows that it wasn't, again, obliviousness. It was more just sort of a naive optimism that things could work out, but that the people that he loves best, the people he cares about, 
that they could care about each other as well. Why can't we make this work? So, but at his weakest, he appears the most commanding. At his sickest, he appears the most decisive and the most lucid. There's a sense of, you know, time is running out and I need to put my house in order. And it is, again, as I said, too little too late. But that scene really shows that, like I said, it's not that he doesn't know which arguably makes things worse because knowing the situation, he really should have done more about it. But it, it comes across again as a king or a, a, a human man. He's just a man and he's a man who loves his family and hoped that they could find a common ground and commonality and, and a way to love each other the way that he loves them. And again, that's it's too naive for a king, but that's what it comes from. It doesn't come from carelessness or obliviousness or stupidity. I talked before about um, how camera angles were used to establish the kind of um, weakness of the series early on in the show about how Damon was presented in a much more domineering angles, the way the camera is angled upward to look at Damon, whereas the camera is often um, positioned in a way that Viserys looks like he's at a level with other people or it's kind of looking down at him. So he appears kind of small and not in control not commanding the room early on in the show. And here, for perhaps the first time, we have several scenes where Viserys is framed as being very commanding. When he takes the throne, and I'll talk about that scene in a bit as it has its own section, but just how Viserys is framed when he enters that room and how the camera is angled upward at him as he is entering the room. And then when he is sitting on the throne and addressing people, the camera is very kind of aggressively angled upward. It's not pulled away and zoomed in and, and level, it's angled upward so that he appears to be above it all and commanding the room, even though he's falling apart. He's, he's a, a corpse on a stick, but he's finally framed as this commanding figure. And the way that his illness is almost what gives him power in the room because the fact that he's shown up that day, if he was a healthy man and he walked into the throne room, you know, what of it, he's the king. But that he has Everyone is aware of the immense effort, immense sacrifice, and immense strength of will that it took for him to just physically show up to that room. And so everything about the music and the camera angles gives him finally this moment of command. I thought that was beautifully done. Moving on then to the dinner scene, which was a fantastic scene. I really once again enjoyed the visual representation of a lot of the dynamics in this show that were at play at the dinner scene. What we have going on at the table is Viserys at the center as he is the center of everything that's going on in this show. And he is seated between Alicent and Renia, the two forces that are kind of tugging him each in their own directions, both of whom care about him and are, and are tied very closely to him and derive their power from him and pull him each in, in opposing directions. He's seated between the two of them. And then Rhaenyra and Alicent each has a devil on her shoulder. So on Rhaenyra's side, she's got Daemon, and on Alicent's side, she's got Otto Hightower. Each of these men encourage the darkest impulses of, of their respective females. Uh, Daemon encourages um, and brings out in Rhaenyra some of her most reckless and her most ambitious and her most uh, rash instincts and behaviors. And Otto Hightower is the one that sort of pushed and goaded Alicent into becoming queen and has since then pushed and whispered and goaded and manipulated. So... We have Alicent and Rhaenyra sitting right next to the king, but on each of their sides are the men who have, through them, sort of tried to control Viserys. But beyond that, the, those two men do have the next closest relationship to Viserys. So they have, you know, Alicent and Rhaenyra, and then Daemon is his brother. Even so, he is not that close to him. He has mainly sought um, Viserys out for political gain rather than as a brother, but he is the next closest to him. And Otto Hightower served as hand of the king for many years. Uh, there was a gap in between, but he's been at his side for a long time. So they are the next closest physically and also in terms of relationships, they are the next closest to Viserys. And then sitting furthest from Viserys is the next generation, the kids. And they also sit farthest apart from each other. The kids have the least um, connection to Viserys and the least connection to the, the origin of this turmoil. They have their own distant understanding of it and how it's affected them but they're not sort of part of this, this genesis point. They don't have a close relationship with the Viserys, um, so they sit the furthest away. And they also, unlike Rhaenyra and Alicent, who have a close relationship with each other and are sitting quite near each other, not just Viserys, the kids don't have a close relationship with each other. So the animosity that exists between Rhaenyra and Alicent exists as, you know, love and hate being two sides of the same coin. They both care about the realm, they both care about the series. There's a lot that Alicent even says we have a lot more in common than we would even allow. They have this shared history of, of love and hate. And the kids who sit really far apart, 
they don't have that. They didn't ever really love each other and they never really got along. There is no foundation of I once cared about you and how and then that soured. They are sitting very far apart from each other. There is nothing between them but animosity. In my video on the previous episode, um, I proposed a uh, an observation that I had made that Allison's side kind of tends to strike first. And I kind of went into what I meant by that. Did not necessarily always mean altercation or, or fighting, but that Allison and people who are on Allison's team and side are the ones to grab and reach and try and attempt things first. They are the primary aggressor most often. Rhaenyra's side is the one that comes out on top. So here at the dinner, uh, Rhaenyra is the one to raise her glass and put into action her father's wishes of reconciliation, of peace, of let's find common ground, let's, you know, can't we all just get along? She's the one that puts puts words to that and puts that into, into play and the rest of the people at the table kind of follow suit and we do end up having a somewhat peaceful time for a little bit. But the first person to break that down, to strike first, is Aemon, Allison's son, and put a stop to that by creating animosity again. And here again, this, this dinner and this table is a microcosm of the larger political situation because the thing that brought all these people to this table to break bread together is Viserys. But the moment that Viserys leaves the room, that peace fractures. The only thing that brought them together and kept them together was Viserys. He's like the cork on this like imminent explosion waiting to happen. And this cork is rotting and it will soon be gone. And there will be nothing to keep this table and these people and these factions together. But during this dinner, we do get a glimpse of what it could look like, an alternate universe where things did work out where we could have all gotten along and found common ground. And it is, it's really tragic to see that in the same way that watching Viserys try to put right and put clarity on the things that he should have a long time ago. In the same way, it's tragic to see this dinner where you can see the, how it, there was a path to that. He wasn't in, entirely crazy to think that that was possible. And he's able to get them to bury the hatchet long enough for us to then see what it would look like, a world in which these people did find a way to get along. And again, um, it's, it's heartbreaking to see them all hating each other and fighting, especially when you knew that Rainier and Allison were friends, but seeing this moment where there is almost a rekindling of that friendship, where Allison is is saying it's so she doesn't want Rainier to leave yet, she's only just arrived, and it seems genuine, it doesn't seem like a political maneuver when she's doing that. In fact, for after Viserys makes his declaration, Otto Hightower looks very uncomfortable with how out of control things, or how much out of his control things have gone, how Allison does seem to want to appease Viserys and does want to make peace with Rhaenyra and, you know, Otto doesn't want that. So it seems like a sincere moment where Allison goes to Rhaenyra and is like, you know, we were, we were friends before. There was, we have more in common than we would allow. You know, she doesn't want her to leave. She would like her to visit. And Rhaenyra says, you know, maybe I'll, I'll come back. Um, you know, after I, my family goes back to Dragonstone, I'll come back. And you see this moment of, you know, this is not how this is going to go. You know that this will not last. And this little brief moment of peace that Viserys manufactured is just that. And it's that much more heartbreaking to see that. If they were all sniping at each other and hating each other at that dinner, that'd be sad to see, but it's not nearly as sad and not nearly as heartbreaking as seeing the almost. Seeing how close to possible Viserys' vision was, that it was not completely impossible. There was enough here, and if things had gone differently, if a thousand little things had gone a little differently, they, they do not have to be enemies, they did not have to be enemies, but you know they're going to be. You know that they've gone too far down this path, too many decisions have been made, too many animosities have been created, but you see this glimpse of what could have been. And because you know it's only a glimpse, you know it's temporary, you know this is not going to last, it is so heartbreaking to see it, but it was so well done. And it did, again, bring back some of that nuance to Allison's character, where she's not just this caricature of this aggressive, catty, hypocritical woman. We had this moment of like where Alicent and Rhaenyra, we are now getting into my Alicent and Rhaenyra section because that's my another section that I have. So I guess segueing then into Alicent and Rhaenyra, we really, I think this is the first time since the time skip that I felt like this feels like the older versions of young Alicent and Rhaenyra because seeing them together, I believed now that these women had this shared history that we witnessed in the early episodes. When we first did this time skip, I was like, this is a different Alicent. That shared history that we saw, that's got nothing to do with this lady. But now in this dinner scene, I did finally feel that this is the Alicent that we saw before. This is Alicent and Rhaenyra. They were friends once upon a time and they could still have been if things had gone differently. Um, but we do see in this episode, Alicent's hypocrisy on full display, the way that she turns a blind eye to her son. Well, I shouldn't say a blind eye. She is, she's not in denial about what her son is doing. 
but she is a hypocrite insofar as her behaviors and her unwillingness to accept any kind of um, questionable behavior from other people when this is what her son is like and what she's willing to do to hush that up and to pay people off. I mean, credit where it's due, she's not unaware. She's not blind. She doesn't think her, her son is an angel. She knows exactly what he is. She even says, you are no son of mine, which does make you wonder why she would fight so hard to get him on the throne, which she will. This is why I think it is important that we did have the Song of Ice and Fire moment there where that is the reasoning then where she believes it doesn't matter. It's not that she thinks that her son is a wonderful human being and that um, and that she, she should, is the best to be king, but that her the Viserys dying words to her seemed to indicate that that's what he wished for. And we do see, our, see also Rhaenyra's continued and escalated willingness to do whatever it takes to retain her position, going to her dying, decrepit father and asking him to fight for her, basically, when you're like, girl, he's in no shape to fight for himself, let alone you. But that's why, again, it was beautiful and tragic and heartbreaking and and everything all wrapped up into one, seeing what he's willing to do to support Rhaenyra to get out of bed and to go to that, and I'll get to that scene in a second, what he does to support her, that final stand that he makes for her. It's a lot that Rainier asked of him and, and to the best of his ability, he showed up for her. And that was, I don't know if I would say a beautiful moment because it is so filled with baggage and tragedy, but it was quite a moment. Uh, moving on then to the kids. As I say, the, the casting is fantastic. Um, actually, I don't think I've said that yet. So, cause this is the first time we've seen the adult versions of the kids. The casting is phenomenal. Um, I'm less fond of the casting for Aegon. I'm fine with it. I don't have a problem with it, but it's it's not very impactful. Like it didn't really leave a big impression on me, but the casting for Aemond is amazing. <laughs> uh, the tension between them is so palpable and every single interaction between them from when they were young to now, you can just, just to see how much it ratchets up the tensions between them and how it's getting closer and closer to a boiling point. Unlike with Alicent and Rhaenyra, as I already said, there is no, oh, they used to love each other and now they don't, something came between them. No, they, they pretty much hated each other from go. So you just feel this escalation of tension as they, as the stakes are raised as we go on and then as they get older and they have more capacity to do harm to each other, you just feel the escalation of that. It is just so tense. I mean, you, you can cut the tension in the air with a knife. And again, the tensions between them, they are not purely just, you know, absorbed by osmosis from their parents. They are not just living out the tensions between their parents um, by extension, they have their own tensions between them. So obviously it's, it probably started with having this bad feeling that they absorbed from the parents, but there is so much animosity between them that is of their own making that if the parents were to magically make peace, that would make very little difference because the second generation, they hate each other for their own reasons. So we have gone too far basically to make peace because they hate each other for, as I say, their own reasons. Uh, moving on then to a brief section about Damon. It's not a very Damon centric episode. It was really, really touching to see him helping Viserys to get up to the throne. And he did seem to be genuinely concerned about how Viserys is being treated and his health. And obviously he does have personal political stake in Viserys being healthy. I mean, he and Rhaenyra showed up there to kind of be like, hey, fight for us. <laughs> you gotta speak up for us, uh, brother. But it, it seemed to me the way that Matt Smith played it, that Damon was concerned for Viserys not simply because he's um, a means of political, of, of attaining the political power that they want, that as a brother, as a family member, as a person that cares about him, that he was concerned about how he was being treated and what he was being doped up with. And it seemed to be coming from a place, again, not just of pure self-interest. I could be wrong, but it seemed to me that he did just care also about the series as a person and it also and then it is just really fun seeing Damon and Amond the anagram interacting I feel like that's there's gonna be a lot more of that and it it is almost cartoonish you know eye patch man it looks like the carbon copy 2.0 version of, of Damon but the two actors playing them have such presence and there's just such um chemistry I guess is the only word I can think of to say uh, to use for them on screen, so I feel like it's there's gonna be some amazing scenes, I suspect, coming up um, that involve Aemond and Damon. Coming then to the throne room scene, which I have already kind of addressed here and there uh, in bits and bobs, but uh, Vaymond and the petition for the, the right of succession for the Driftwood throne. I've seen, I, I also thought this, and but I also have seen a lot of people draw parallel between him and Ned Stark. And like I said, I thought that too, when I first watched the episode. Um, I, I thought to myself, you know, 
it's kind of like Ned Stark, but also why do I not support him? Like, why do I not feel like the way that I did about Ned Stark being like, yeah, he's speaking the truth. He's the good guy. And I mean, obviously there's the fact that unlike with the Lannisters, in this show, we are sort of been steered towards rooting for Rhaenyra and he is speaking against Rhaenyra. Whereas in Game of Thrones, you are steered towards rooting against the Lannisters. Ned Stark is speaking against the Lannisters. So you would naturally root for that. So there is that. But I don't think it's just that. Because when Ned Stark speaks out against the the Lannisters, there isn't really much self-interest involved in that. He really has he he really only stands to lose by doing that. Um, whereas while it's risky for Vaymond to do this, it is nothing ventured, nothing gained kind of situation. He stands to gain a great deal by speaking out. So he by the end of it, he seems to have a death wish, but initially his purpose in in coming forward and, and trying to secure his claim is a self-interested, uh, he has it's self-interested reasons for him doing so. Whereas again, Ned Stark is just saying, speaking the truth for truth's sake, more or less. Certainly he has loyalties to his friend, Robert Baratheon. I guess you could say he has a stake in Joffrey not being king because who wants that? But he, he himself doesn't really stand to gain anything by that. So yeah, for, for that reason, this speaking out feels less noble and less virtuous in the part of Vaymond that he's so aggressively not just speaking out, but this too is a difference that Ned Stark tried, was rather naive about how he handled things, but he tried to protect Joffrey and to try to get, you know, Cersei and, and um, to run away and to make sure that Joffrey would be safe. Uh, he didn't want anything to happen to Joffrey purely because he was speaking the truth about, you know, his lineage. And obviously Cersei laughs at him about that because, you know, that's not how the world works. But but Vaymond doesn't seem bothered at all about putting these young innocent boys in, in the line of fire because they themselves are not the cause of his ire. It's not their fault who their parents were. So what he's doing to the boys is quite cruel. And Ned Stark was naive, but he did try to kind of minimize harm where he could. And Vaymond is not doing that. <laughs> not at all. But it does look like if you call royalty a bastard, you lose your head. <laughs> What happened to Ned? It's what happens to Vaymond. I did think the scene where the, the moment where Damon cuts off his head was a bit cartoonish, uh, a bit silly. Uh, it was, I mean, it was a cool shot. Like visually speaking, it was a cool shot. It was a, it kind of made my night when he cut his head off after, uh, after Viserys said, you know, you'll lose your tongue for that. And Damon cuts his head off, but the tongue remains. And my brother and I were like, he didn't even lose his tongue. Only to have Damon say he can keep his tongue. So like that kind of made my night. <laughs> I feel like they could have had a scene like this and it feels slightly, le slightly less cartoonish if after Viserys said, you'll lose your tongue for that, if Vaymond had put up a big fight, had, had tried to resist arrest and, 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 you know, violently lashed out and that while the guards attempted to subdue him, that Damon stepped in and just, you know, then it, w it would seem a little, a little bit more justified that he just cut his head off, you know? Uh, so the way they several times in the show now have like just casually let people get away with just murdering people right in front of everybody. We were like, I mean, they did have laws. You know, you can just, just march in and just murder somebody in front of everybody. Like, I mean, I guess Damon is the prince, but you know, at least give plausible reasoning for, you know, like he started it. I, I was fighting back because he was resisting as opposed to just like from behind cutting his hat off. I heard the actor who played Vaymon say that too, that he's like, oh, he didn't, he didn't face me. He kept my head off from behind, which again, like if he had been like resisting and the Damon stepped in to do that, it would have made a little bit more sense, but it's, it's, it's not a big deal. It is what it is. It's, it's a shot for the show is what it is. But there is something that Viserys says in this scene um, that I really want to kind of take a minute to talk about because this is a thing that has been really, really irritating me um, with some of the responses I've seen to this show. And I was so pleased that he said this. Um, and it's something that I, I've kind of meant to bring up, but it just, I haven't found an, uh, an opportunity to do so. But when people keep talking about how, of course, Alice is, is upset because Rhaenyra's children are bastards. And so the legitimacy of the succession is at stake here. Of course, you should care about that, blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, Rhaenyra's children are Rhaenyra's children. And Rhaenyra is the heir to the throne, not her husband. So if Alicent's children were bastards, that would be a big old problem because they would not be Targaryens. They would not be heirs to the throne. They would not be blood relations of the king. But Rhaenyra is the heir to the throne. So her children are her children. So their parentage on her side is what matters. 
And while it's not ideal that her kids would be bastards, it is, it is beyond question that they are Targaryens. And so her kids are just as legitimately options for the throne as Jon Snow um, or as Gendry later is in Game of Thrones. Those were bastards. So if they can legitimately claim the throne, so can Rhaenyra's children. So it just really irritates me that, because typically speaking, yes, if it's a bastard, it's usually the dude that's in line for the throne. So if those kids are not his kids, like in the case of Robert and Cersei, the fact that Robert's kids were bastards, they were not his children. So they aren't legitimately heirs to the Iron Throne through the king. And then it would matter. But Rhaenyra is the heir. Her kids are her kids. So in terms of the Targaryen succession, well, not ideal. It's fine. <laughs> the blood is, is there. And so when Viserys says that, when he's being challenged, this is about the Driftmark throne. But when he tells Vaymond, you know who those boys are? They are Targaryens. They are my grandsons. Because he's, that's the truth of it. Okay, they're, they're not Laenor's kids, but they are Viserys' grandsons. They are Targaryens. So this idea that like them being bastards makes them uh, invalid or, or not royal heirs, that simply isn't the case. So my final section, um, I've titled uh, Book Changes. It's not a ton. It's just kind of some things in this episode that make me wonder what they're going to do. Um, so the way this episode ends um, with Viserys' death, um, I was talking to my family about this. I'm not going to say what, because you can guess what's going to happen, I think, especially if you've watched the preview for the next episode. But nevertheless, I won't say. But based on what... I'm, I don't think the, this, they would change this um, in any substantial way. Uh, what is about to happen... I wonder a little bit about how they're going to manage to do that. Um, so again, having read the book, if I hadn't read the book, I'd be like, okay, this is what's happened. It's because I've read the book and I know what's supposed to happen next. that I'm a little bit like, mm, how are you going to pull that off? <laughs> so we'll see. I'm sure they will pull it off. Um, it's not totally impossible, but the, the timing of things and where people are right now is kind of where I'm like, this isn't quite, quite. <laughs> I don't quite see how you're going to pull this off. So we'll see how they do it. I'm sure they will manage to do it. In the book, um, it is suggested that a po it is a possibility that Allison might have poisoned Viserys on that last night, that that's how he dies. I think the show makes it pretty clear that in their version of events, in, in the show's telling of it, that that is not at all an option for what has happened, that Allison has not poisoned Viserys. Arguably, she and her, her team, her cohort, were slowly poisoning him with what they were doping him up to keep him sedated and out of it. Uh, lots of milk of the poppy, as, you know, Damon was pretty upset about. So in that sense, you know, a, a slow poisoning, I suppose. But the again, the implication in the book is that the night that he dies, he's poisoned by Alicent, possibly. And I think, again, the show makes it pretty clear that she did not. And I like that because, again, this episode did a lot to kind of bring us to walk back some of what we did with Alicent and kind of show that she is a human being who did care for Rhaenyra, did care for Viserys, is not a machine, has empathy, is is more like the younger Alicent that we saw, that she's still in there. And if she had poisoned Viserys, that would have been wildly out of character for this for this iteration of Alicent. Yeah, I like that they did away with that idea altogether. In a similar vein, um, a, a departure from the book that's just been ongoing overall and here is most starkly visible. Um, Viserys in the book is sickly, but in a very, very different way. He's sort of plump and gout ridden. And there's sort of this, the sense you get, or at least I get, is that He's kind of, you know, a guy that just kind of just kind of wants to like, you know, live and be happy and, you know, don't worry, be happy. Can't we all just get along? I'm going to eat a bunch and like have gout and kind of not care that I'm definitely setting us up for instability in the realm after I'm gone. Here in the show, um, I very, very much like that they made Viserys come across as somebody burdened by the responsibility of position. And he may not have been the right person to be king because he's too sort of being hearted to make tough decisions and tough calls. He loves the people around him and he's so concerned with wanting to please the people that he loves um, sort of at the expense of governing the realm in a stable way. I like that they that that's more kind of the story of Viserys and the way that he's becoming more and more sickly and the idea that instead of being like this sort of like plump gout ridden like good time king that he's he's in fact it's the literal opposite he's like shrinking as the the weight of illness and burden and responsibility is like eating him alive it's con he's being consumed by the responsibility that he holds the weight of the realm and the crown and the throne so i i, I like the idea that that what makes him a, a poor leader ultimately is love and optimism rather than 
carelessness and self-interest. So I, I very much enjoyed this portrayal overall of Viserys and I feel like this is the best time to talk about it because that's it. That's all, all she wrote for Viserys. Well done. Definitely brought much more depth to the character in my opinion in a way that I very very much enjoyed and as I said already at the beginning of the video the actor playing him did a phenomenal job but you know it was it's a combination of things. The way they wrote the character and the way that he played the character they just did an amazing job with Viserys in the show. So well done. And yeah, we are now entering the Dance of the Dragons. It's finally happening. <laughs> I'm very excited slash nervous because you know it's it's gonna be dark times but that's what we all signed up for. That's what this the whole the project of this show is. So I am excited but it's, it's gonna be tense. So there's probably gonna be a ton to unpack. I will miss Viserys but well done and we are off we go. It's gonna be a wild ride. So let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about episode eight. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you think some stuff was dumb? Did you think it was all perfect? Do you agree or disagree with my takes? Whatever, let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times, well, but only Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you.